God is just good. Y'all feel that? God is good. You know, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, we'd all been swaddled up by all the craziness that's happening in life. But uh, the scripture says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I was sitting over there, even as uh, Pastor Mike was saying, reflecting on the similar sentiments that he shared. This is the first time I've preached in a church since before the pandemic. And, and I was sitting over there going, man, uh, uh, preached my first sermon here 24 years ago and then haven't preached in two years. So today, y'all pray for me. We'll see if the Lord can knock some of the dust off. Amen. You know, get a little dust on you. But, uh, but how many know it's never been us for anything that we do, whether we're worshiping, whether we're preaching, whether we're serving, um, it's really the spirit of God. And as the saints used to tell us growing up, it's really only what you do for Christ that will have a lasting impact and a lasting effect. So pray with me real quick as we get started. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for loving us in spite of us. We want to thank you for uh, your mercy. We want to thank you for taking care of us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for bringing us through such a difficult period, Lord, over the last couple of years. And many are still emerging from it. And people are still struggling, Lord. I just conversations I've had with people over the last week who are still sick with COVID or struggling with long uh, COVID and, and just trying to reemerge, find themselves. Uh, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you're in the middle of all of the messiness that life is. So, Lord, as we've gathered together as a community of people, Lord, I pray that your spirit would anoint my mouth, my tongue. Lord, uh, get rid of my own mind, my own thoughts, my own agenda, and let what it is that your spirit would want to say in this moment, Lord, to those of us who are here listening. Uh, Lord, use us to advance the world you are making, uh, Lord, and do it in us. Uh, Lord, that we then can be instruments that do it in the world. Uh, we say it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, well, I'm not going to be before you long, and that's just not a Pentecostal preacher euphemism. Amen. You know, somebody gets up, they're like, I'm not going to be before you long. And then you've been up a very long time. Amen. But don't, so we're not going to pray. Uh, as one of our mentors uh, told me years ago, uh, he said, Ben, don't make the people happy twice. Amen. Happy to see you get up and happy to see you sit down. Praise God. Right. So we, we strive that hopefully the spirit uh, helps us get happy one time uh, today. I'm going to be talking today uh, for just a few minutes around this uh, notion of finding your way home. Finding your way home. I'm going to be reading from uh, the gospel uh, of Luke, the 15th chapter. And it says, then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. Uh, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the wealth that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant region. And there he squandered his wealth in dissolute, or some translations say riotous living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that region. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that region who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Um, again, talking for a few minutes about finding your way home. Uh, you know, the Gospel of Luke has always been my favorite gospel. Um, you know, the different gospels are written in different ways, you know, from different authors with different perspectives. But I've always really liked the gospel uh, according to Luke uh, because, as some theologians state, uh, the gospel of Luke is the scripture told from the perspective of the outsider. 
It's, it's the story of Jesus told from the perspective of someone who does not believe that they are inside the inner circle. It's told from the perspective of someone who is not a Jew, someone who would identify as uh, a Greek, somebody who is outside of the group looking inside and looking at the way that Jesus tells uh, the story about how we should be reconciled to God. And I've always loved the way that Luke talks about Jesus and he talks about these stories because I feel like Luke is kind of sitting outside the crowd being a little bit of a narrator for us around what's happening uh, in the story. You know, the author C.S. Lewis says, what you see depends on where you're standing. Right? What you see depends on where you're standing. You, you like me, have uh, been at a fight uh, at a day in your life. You don't tell anybody, but you know, for some reason, you remember we were young, now somebody fight in, you know, you got to go run and see, right? Then you get there, you get all anxious, your blood is rattling, and you don't, then you run away, right? But for some reason, you run to the fight. But if you ask somebody at the end of the fight, what happened at the fight, everybody's got a different perspective around what happened at the fight. Because what you see depends on where you're standing. So I want to talk first just about a little bit the context, and I'm going to make a couple points about the text, and then we're going to go home. But first around the context, if you go a little bit higher in Luke chapter 15, uh, Luke sets this stage for us where Jesus is in conversation with people about this idea of lostness. And what's interesting is that Jesus is sitting amongst people who some have deemed sinners and tax collectors. It's always very interesting to me when somebody deems somebody else a sinner, as if somehow, you know, the state of sinning is a state to live in rather than a challenge that we all wrestle with. But, you know, it's very easy for us to pay attention to the sin in other people's lives and not always pay attention to the sin in our own lives. Amen, lights. I wish somebody was in the room, right? You know, it's usually the things that you struggle with that are very low on the totem pole. The things that other people struggle with are very high on the totem pole. I can't believe they did that. And then when you do what you do, you're like, well, you know, everybody got to have grace and mercy. You should understand, right? But the reality is that we have this story Luke's telling us where uh, it says Jesus is sitting with sinners uh, and tax collectors. And the Pharisees are sitting around them, it seems like Luke is telling this story, because the Pharisees are struggling with trying to figure out why is Jesus sitting with people that we have deemed sinners and tax collectors? Why is the person who somehow was supposed to be good hanging in the space with people who are wrong? And, you know, I, in, in the past, and even as I thought about my time being in this building and, and, you know, this building being a very sacred place for me because it's the beginning of my own spiritual story, as Pastor Mike was saying, but I was thinking about all of the spiritual stories and practices that we've done in this building over the course of 40 plus years, right? There were times in our building where there was a very small circle, right, of human concern and who could belong in the space. But, and, and sometimes when we think about those things, it's easy for us to judge. I can't believe that people would be wary of other people in these different kinds of ways. Uh, we look at the Pharisees, and sometimes we give the Pharisees uh, a hard time. You know, when we talk about the scriptures, we say, like, the Pharisees, they were always hating on Jesus. And the Pharisees were always this, and the Pharisees were always that. But if we're honest, a lot of us got a little Pharisee inside of me. And one of the things that's interesting about the Pharisees, I got the chance to talk to one of our Jewish relatives some years ago, and we were doing some bridging conversations from Christians and, and Jewish people, and he told me, you know, it always bothers me how bad you Christians talk about the Pharisees. And I said, why? He said, because you talk about the Pharisees without context. He said, the Pharisees were wary of Jesus because they had been uh, occupied and oppressed by the Romans and the Greeks and the Babylonians and the Persians. And so they were doing their best to try to protect the people that they loved. And when Jesus showed up talking about things that they felt was going to disrupt the status quo and potentially get people killed, a lot of their pushing Jesus out didn't necessarily have anything to do individually with Jesus as much as it had to do with them trying to protect the people that they loved. And so I want to talk to us first in this context about trauma and triggers. 
Because I think, you know, one of the challenges about us trying to find our way home in this crazy life that we're in, struggling with our humanity, trying to hold on to God's divinity in a crazy world, I think one of the challenges we wrestle with is how do we deal with our own trauma and triggers? Because sometimes the trauma and the pain that has happened in our lives has a lot to do with whether we make ourselves available for God to make change in us or whether we end up resisting God trying to make change in us. Triggers, things that have happened to us because we have been victims of violence, victims of betrayal, victims of being let down, can oftentimes have us in the presence of Jesus, but not proximate to the power of Jesus. Are y'all hearing me? The Pharisees, because of their trauma, were literally in Jesus' presence, but they could not access his power because they were too controlled by their own trauma and triggered around what Jesus might present for the conditions of their lived reality. You know, over the last two years during this season of quietness, I, I feel like I've had a chance to do some own reflection uh, myself. Because I thought about all the work that, you know, we've been doing in the movement. And at a certain point, you know, how many of y'all have had this experience that sometimes when God wants to get his, uh, get your attention, uh, he has to, as Martin said in A Thin Line Between Love and Hate years ago, he got to break you all the way down to your brake pads. Any of y'all familiar with that euphemism? Anybody ever had God break you all the way down to your brake pads? Some of y'all act like y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, when God done set your car over on four blocks, you can't go nowhere, right? You got an engine, a steering wheel, and a transmission. <laughs> but you ain't going nowhere, right? Break you all the way down to your brake pads because sometimes God is trying to have conversations with us that we can't have unless we're not moving. And one of the things that I felt like God really started showing me, I had this powerful experience about 18 months ago where God refilled me with the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't know that I needed a refilling. But one of the things, <laughs> that's, that's another message right there, right? But one of the things that the Lord showed me was that I had become so engaged in the movement for racial justice that I had stopped believing in God's power to actually deliver us from the racism that we were engaging. And I got to this place where I felt like in my own power, I had to be the one to be in line to help change the conditions of what's happened over the last 400 years. And the pain of that, and the depression of that, and the suffering of that, and showing up at every place where I'm looking at our loved ones and they got bullets in their bodies, or you're holding mothers who've lost their children to either community gun violence or police violence, or we're marching in the streets against the Nazis and the white supremacists, and, and we're rolling around like Batman with collars on. But what the Lord began to show me was that your trauma and your triggers have you in my presence, but actually disconnected from my power. And you now have turned yourself into a God of your own understanding, where somehow you believe that it's through your power and through your might that you're gonna be able to change conditions rather than recognizing that it's through your surrender and through your humility and through your obedience to me that I will begin to activate through you whatever I choose to do. And that if I, as God, have been willing to sit over all of these different ex ex experiences of oppression over the thousands and thousands of years, that I cannot make the one moment that I'm living in the God of my own experience, but that God was telling me, you're in my presence, but you're not proximate to my power. Because you haven't learned how to deal with your trauma and your triggers. And that's why I believe Jesus says to us in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. Y'all see this? and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. 
and learn of me. This word yoke in, in, in the construct here doesn't necessarily uh, only mean the, the way we understand it as a yoke of an oxen, like something is the, a new burden is going to be put on you. But also another way to think about yoke was uh, during this time, rabbis had something that was called a yoke, meaning a teaching, meaning a way of orienting yourself towards life. And so if you read that, that Jesus is saying, take on the way that I want you to live in this world. And learn from me, because the way that I will lead you, you're going to be able to find rest for your soul. One of the things I think as, as particularly black folks and brown folks and people who are proximate to oppressed folks and people experience marginalization in life, if not careful, our trauma and the ways we are justifiably triggered can actually rob us from the very love, joy, and healing that God wants us to have in our lives. The love of God is enough. Do y'all hear me? The love of God in our lives is enough to bring the kind of healing and power and restoration if we will make ourselves available to God. And so one of the things I want to be inviting us to think about is the notion of trauma and triggers. While we do our work, and I'm here to tell y'all I have had and am still had to learn how to do my work. We got to go to the therapist and we got to, you know, we, some of us need to go see multiple therapists, praise God. But while we are doing that work, we need to be invited to recognize that God is not asking us to become the Savior. God is actually inviting us to surrender to the Savior. And so here in this story, uh, we go into this notion of the story of what has been called popularly the story of the prodigal son. So I'm going to talk for a moment about lostness and foundness. Uh, you see, this lost son in this narrative, um, many of us have heard this story before. Uh, this, this person makes some poor decisions. Uh, they tell their father, they say, I want to have what belongs to me. You have some inheritance, you have some money, you have some opportunity, and I want the things that belong to me so that I can go and pursue the life that I want to have. And in this story, the lost son gets uh, his wealth, he gets his inheritance, he gets his estate, and he goes away and goes off into the far country. And he engages in what the scriptures call, uh, I like the King James version of this, riotous living. He takes what belongs to him and uses it in the wrong way. I want to talk to us a minute about this notion of lostness because sometimes God has things for us, but it's not time. And our inability to be patient to wait for the right time and season for God to give us what we want can have a tendency to land us in a place we don't want to be. Sometimes we're saying, Lord, I want to be married. And the Lord is like, I know you want to be married, but you don't need to be married right now. Amen. Uh, Lord, I want to have money. Yeah, but if I give you money right now, that money is actually going to cause you to move further away from me and your purpose than closer. Lord, I want to have this opportunity open up. But the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that there is a time and season set under heaven for every purpose. And so one of the things that we've got to hold is that just because God has given us gifts and just because God has given us uh, skills and just because there are things that belong to us for the purpose of our lives does not always mean it is the right season. Sometimes doors are closed for us because it's protecting us. You know, I heard Bishop Jones say some years ago, Bishop Noel Jones, we were uh, doing something some years ago called Ecclesia Conference. We were bringing churches together to fellowship together. And I remember this powerful line. He said, sometimes God has to keep things back from us because God is trying to allow our character to catch up with our calling. Sometimes God has called you and God has gifted you. But you are not yet ready for the things that God is actually trying to lead you into. And in this story, we have this prodigal son who has access and in the inheritance of things that belong to him, but he wants them too soon. And when he gets what actually belongs to him too early, he uses it in the wrong way. He ends up in the far country. 
He ends up using all of his resources. He finds himself broke down to his brake pads again and finds himself in a pen with pigs. You see, when you are outside the timing of God, you find yourself hanging with people that really ain't worth your presence. Any of y'all ever had that experience before? That you jumped God a little bit or you jumped an opportunity a little bit or, or you got a little zealous about something and the next thing you knew, you looked around and tried to figure out how in the heaven, praise God, did I end up with these people? And then have you ever had the moment where you look back in your life and you look at some of the decisions you've made and you try to figure out how in the world did I see myself as being in relationship with some of these characters I've been in a relationship with. The, the version of you would never even have a snack with the version of some of the people that we spent time with. I mean, can, can we just call a spade a spade, right? Sometimes you look back at a version of yourself and you don't even understand yourself. Some versions of myself, I wouldn't even have an iced tea with myself and I am me, praise God. <laughs> because sometimes we can be moving faster than what the Spirit of God is really inviting us to move. But the thing that I love about this notion of lostness and foundness in the way in which Jesus tells this story is that regardless as to the poor decisions that the son made in this story, the Bible says that as he was recognizing and coming to himself, we've all got to have those moments where we come to ourselves. And I want to say this, regardless as to where you are in your life today, if you feel like some things haven't been working out, maybe you found yourself at the intersection point of having made some decisions that didn't work out. In the last two years, you've just been trying to figure out what does it mean for you to keep your head above water and things haven't necessarily gone the way uh, that you thought or you inherited some things that you actually didn't think you deserved. I want us to say that regardless as to where we find ourselves, what I love about this story is that when the son comes to himself and says, I have a father at home who is there to love and take care of me. When he comes down the road, the scripture says that the father was waiting for his son. What I love about this story is there is no bad we can do that somehow moves God away from us. The choices we make might move us away from God, but there is nothing we can do that moves God away from us. The picture that I love in this story is that when the son comes running home to his father, the father sees him afar off and comes running to him. What I want you to know is if you're struggling or going through trials and tribulations, trying to figure out how to put things back together in your life, you're not just running to God, but God is actually running to you. Isn't it a great encouragement to know that in the middle of my suffering and my pain and my challenge that I don't have to do all the work to run to God, but that God is doing work to run to me. That when marriages fall apart and jobs fall apart and money falls apart and the whole world falls apart, I am not just trying to run to God. God is seeking to run to me. That God actually knew myself was falling apart before I did. Any of y'all ever been around a little kid that's trying to learn how to walk? And they stand up, you know, and they're just so happy that they're able to balance. And they're looking at you with that kind of silly smile a little bit, you know, like, can you, and you, as the adult, you're looking at them going, you're about five seconds from busting your head to the white meat, right? But they they just excited, and, and you're so excited because you're recognizing these are steps in order for you to walk. And you watch this baby as they're reeling and rocking, and right when they're about to fall down and bust their head wide open, you jump right in to scoop them up. Right? The scripture says that a righteous man falls down seven times, but the Lord upholds him with his strong hand. I want to encourage us today to recognize that even in the midst of our lostness in our lives, God is compassionately running and moving towards us. Now, I think that as God is moving towards us, we also must be the children of God who begin to recognize that sometimes as God is withholding things from us, there are things we don't necessarily know about our lives and that we have to, as Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am in to be somebody say content. 
I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. Proverbs 14 says, there is a way that seems right unto a man. Any of y'all ever been in a part of your life where you're doing something that seemed right? It seemed right. Right? That relationship seems right. Right? That, that financial opportunity seems right. Right? But the end of it leads to death. And not just physical death, but the death of opportunities. The death of our hope and our aspirations and our inspiration. And so I want to invite and encourage us to recognize that God is calling us to think about this notion of lostness and foundness and recognize while there's nothing you can do to escape my compassion and my love, God is also inviting us to think differently about where I want to land this plane a little bit. It's talking about the notions of sin and grace. Now, you know, I know in, in the churches that we grew up, they did a lot talking about sin. <laughs> Everything was sin. I was joking, who was I with the other day? I was telling somebody, I said, I grew up in an old apostolic church where won't nobody say but the 32 people at our church, amen, right? And some of them was questionable, right? <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, I, I, I remember some of the old I was actually looking at some old videos I found. I went out to visit our grandmother and I found all these old videotapes of this building back in the mid 80s and the late 80s. You know, when we were 10, 11 and 12 years old, you know, and, and I was watching these old testimony services. Some of y'all don't know what testimony service is, but you know, they had the outlaw testimony service and I, I saw why, amen, you know. <laughs> Some folks turned testimony service into a free therapy session, praise God, right? <laughs> Got up, praise the Lord, saints, praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord, saints, praise the Lord. I said, praise, you know, once they got to that third praise the Lord, saints, you knew we gonna be here a little while, praise God, right? And when they start off, so you see, saints, I was in a car. And I'm like, all right, we about to go and get the lemonade. We about to be here a while. But I recognize during that time, there was a lot of time where we focused on sin. And I think even there, we may have focused a little bit too much. But what I do want to invite us in our generation is not to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. Now, when we think about the notion of sin, sin simply just means missing the mark coming up short. We all sin. The Bible says, Romans 3.23, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But the Bible says for us in Romans chapter 6, should we continue in sin just so that grace can increase? Just because we do sin doesn't mean we should just make a habit of sinning. When I think about this story with the uh, lost son and running into the far country, I think one of the challenges that we face in our moment and in our generation is a lack of clarity that the far country is, in fact, the far country. Y'all picking up what I'm putting down? No. Okay, the notion that that there is no kind of way of engaging with each other and the world that is falling short of the way that God intends for us to engage with one another in the world. And the challenge I think we face in this moment is the notion where we can lean into a place where somehow we get to become the God of our own understanding, right? And some of y'all have heard me say when I've been here in times past that if every thought you have, God is agreeing with you, that's probably not God. Right? I mean, if God is just your co-signer on every, I mean, listen, I don't feel like I'm a bad dude, but I have some thoughts and I'm pretty sure God not co-signing on. Amen. Right? There's, there's some ways when I get my feelings hurt and I start feeling vengeful and I'm going to get back at you, I don't think that's God. Right? You ever talk to somebody who's obviously sinning? Like, it's obvious, right? And they tell you, you know how they shut the conversation down? God told me. Right? You stealing money. Yeah, but God told me. 
God told me to take it. Let me tell you something. God never needs sin to establish righteousness. God don't need sin. God, God is not the devil. God, God is not somehow like at war with the devil, like for, you know, the, the most spiritual championship, you know, of the universe and God's. They're not at war. The devil is a fallen angel. The representation of evil around the world, the representation of the faultiness of our own human experience. But God is not at war with the devil. God has invited us to say, I am inviting you. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth, Isaiah 55, so are my ways and your ways. God tells to us, let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. God says, I am calling you away from the way that is easy for you, that causes you to be in conflict and to treat one another with spite, disrespect, and in a wicked way. And and the one thing that I want to invite us to do is we're all going to mess up and we're going to make mistakes because we're human. But when we recognize that, that we are learning and God is teaching us that we have got to get ourselves together. That God is, in fact, calling us to get ourselves together. I believe that the Spirit would invite us to say to come out of the far country of your life. I want to invite you to be thinking about in reflection, what is the far country of my life? Where is the place that I go emotionally and mentally when things in my life aren't working out and when I, am just, when I am just not my best self, what does that far country look like? What does my language sound like when I'm in the far country? How do I treat people when I'm in the far country? What kind of behavior show up when I'm in the far country? And how do I recognize that when I come back home to God and that God is always inviting me to come back home, that God is calling me not to bring the far country with me? But to leave the far country and actually come and find myself back at home. You know, one of the things that inspired for me this notion, I've been thinking about it for the last month, uh, this notion of what does it mean to come back home? We were training some faith leaders uh, last month here in the city of Oakland, and we had Pastor Mike come through, and he told the story that uh, Dr. Cornell West, we had Dr. Cornell West uh, being the speaker for this gathering, and Mike told a story that I have forgotten. Back when we had uh, got, all gotten arrested in Ferguson, back in 2014, it's crazy to me that that was eight years ago, you know, but when I see pictures and I see I was slimmer, hey man, I know it was eight years ago, right? Y'all, that's, that's part of my far country, y'all pray my strength, right? Uh, I'm trying to lead that far country and all of its goodies there, amen, and, and I need to come home to my father's house and eat some vegetables, praise God, right? But in any case, I was listening to a story that he told, and he said as he and Dr. West, who got arrested before uh, a few of us, and he said they were in the jail, and, you know, the, these jailers, you know, this had been a very emotional, hard day. We had stood in the rain for hours. We had been pushed on the ground by the police. That, I mean, it, it had been a terribly violent, traumatic day. Rain so hard, I literally had to throw my suit in the garbage because the, the sleeves were tearing apart at the threads because of the amount of water that had come on us and being pushed and, and thrown around by uh, the police. But Pastor Mike said when they got into the booking station, he said that Dr. West was saying to the, the jailers as they were arresting them, oh, hey, how you doing, good brother? Oh, thank you, good sister. Okay, yeah, you want me to come over here? All right, thank you, good brother. Thank you, good sister. Oh, how are you doing? Good, good day. How you doing? Thank you, good brother. Thank you, good sister. And then all this been around Dr. West, you know, he talks like that. When he's around us, hey, how you doing, good brother? Oh, good to see you. You know, he take that same picture with everybody. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Hey, good brother, good sister. He said, but he was acting the same way with the police. And Pastor Mike asked him, he said, why are you dealing with the police like this, with all that they're doing to us? And, and he said, and I hope I don't butcher the line, he said, uh, bro, he said, oh, good brother, good brother, good brother. He said, make sure you leave the light on because you never know when people will find their way home. I've been thinking about that for the last month. What does it mean for us to leave the light on for people? 
so that they can find their way home. But you know, you know the way that it hit me? I was so grateful because God leaves the light on for us. Aren't you glad that God has left the light on for you? So when we find our way home, we must be people that come home and leave these wicked ways behind us. So that God can use us to leave the light on for others who are also seeking to find their way home. Living outside of God's will does not lead us to the life we want for ourselves. So in Romans 6, it also says, don't let sin reign in your bodies so that you obey their desires. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but excuse me, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Beloved, I want to encourage us to think about this notion that God is present to bring us from any place of lostness we might find ourselves in. But that God is also inviting us to become instruments of God's mercy and God's grace because in this world that we're living in, and as crazy as things are, God needs us to be leaving the light on for many more people who need to find their way home. We can't control what happens in this crazy world. And we're limited by the limitations of our humanity, but God's spirit can give us the power to find our way home. Stand on your feet with me. I want to invite us here today Wherever it is that you might find yourself in your life, I want to invite you to take a moment to survey yourself. Are you in the far country right now? Are you in the pit with the pigs? Maybe you're trying to ask yourself whether you should make a journey to come back and get connected with God in the way that you've been before. Maybe you feel like, you know what, I'm actually right where God needs me to be, but I need God to really help me ensure that I'm the kind of person that can leave the light on for others that are coming home. And to check me that I can be an instrument of grace and not just somebody that can point out other people's sin. May we be those that help Others find their way home as we find our way home. But I want you to survey yourself. And wherever it is that you are, I want you to lift that to the Lord as we go into some words of prayer. As this is the month for revival, we're asking God to revive us as we go into this last few months of this year. Lord, revive my faith. Lord, revive my energy and my heart and my drive to, Lord, seek you in the way that I should seek you. Lord, revive in me, Lord, the faith to believe that you are actually able to confront the big challenges that are facing our world. Lord, revive in me, Lord, the faith to know that I belong in the family of God. Lord, revive in me the strength Lord, to come to myself if I am outside of your will. Lord, call me to be who you are desiring me to be in this moment. I want to just invite you. Let's just all lift our hands to heaven right now, and I'm going to pray a prayer for us. Lord, we pray right now as we have our hands lifted to you. Lord, we are praying right now for the spirit of refreshing to come down upon us as your people. Lord, this has been a difficult season for many of us, Lord, and some of us are still in the difficult season right now. Lord, we pray right now that your spirit would come down with the wind of refreshing. Lord, we pray right now that your spirit would come, Lord, and fill every void that is existing within our hearts and our minds. Where there is discouragement, Lord, I pray right now for encouragement. 
Lord, where there is fear, God, we pray right now that you would come and bring comfort. Lord, where there is anxiety, God, we come that you would, we pray that you would come and bring peace right now in the name of Jesus. And we pray right now, God, for the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Let that same power, God, let it come down and fill our hearts and fill our minds. Lord God, let it come and fill the homes where we live. God, we pray right now that you would surround us with a mighty presence of angels. Lord, we pray right now that you would fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, breathe a fresh wind. Breathe a fresh wind over us right now. Breathe a fresh wind over us right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, worship team. Go ahead and sing that for us. Won't go back. Can't go back to the way it used to be. For your presence came and changed me. Now I want to invite you right now, and I know we're in the middle of COVID, so we'll wash our hands after, but I want to encourage you to grab the hands of the person next to you. Because a part of this season that's been tough has been us not being able to touch one another. And I want you to grab the hands of the person next to you, and I want you to squeeze their hand as an act of letting them know that they are not in this struggle by themselves. Squeeze their hand and let them know that I am here with you. Squeeze their hand as an act to show that God is with them. And squeeze into their hand right now a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. Squeeze into their hand the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Squeeze into their hand the power and the joy of the Lord that will be their strength. We won't go back. We can't go back to the way things used to be. For the presence of God has come and saved us. If you believe that God has found you and that you are coming into a deeper expression of the grace of God, I want you to go ahead and put your hands together and let's give God some praise here on this day.